as a queer person too, it, it, it troubled me and at first confused me a little bit about how normative culture says that you have to be cisgender and you have to be heterosexual and you have to be monogamous in order to matter or in order to be normal. And my experience, my personal experience of the world was not any of those things. And, you know, so I stumbled into sex positivity almost by necessity, just in searching for answers about, you know, if, if I don't, if I'm not conventional or normal enough, what what am I? Is there is there language or or ideas um, for for what I experience in the world and from for for what I want? So welcome to the Give and Consent podcast. My goal is to introduce you to the people and ideas behind sex positivity. And today I'm joined by Mix Nikki Andres. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm, I'm excited to talk to you because you're one of those people that I met at my very first sex positive event that I ever went to. Um, I went on a meetup group. Someone brought me to this orientation. I didn't really know what it was uh, to introduce people to this idea of just sex positivity and that you can get together with people and enjoy that space. And um, I guess what I want to start with is kind of defining for people um, some of those ideas behind it, like when we're talking about your your gender, your orientation and relationship style, can you, can you kind of give us a, a breakdown of what those things mean as we jump into it? Yeah, of course. So um, gender is a complex sociological and psychological concept that can even further be broken down into gender identity, which is how you feel on the inside, um, gender expression, how you communicate to the rest of your community and society what your gender is. And um, there's gender performance as well, uh, which is for me kind of like the degree to which you um, ascribe to certain gender norms or gender expectations. Um, and you know, all of these things can kind of, I think of them as a grab bag where they don't always need to line up according to expectations from your culture. Um, but for a lot of people they do, and that's totally, that's totally fine. But gender overall, I would say is um, a sociological construct and a dimension of a person's identity. Sexual orientation uh, is who or how, I think was probably a better way to say it, how um, we are, find ourselves sexually attracted, romantically attracted, emotionally attracted um, to, and turned on by, let's be frank, um, you know, sometimes it's a just very sexy, carnal sort of uh, um, attraction. In, uh, the types of uh, people and things that we're attracted to things. Don't mean to say things. I mean, that's, you know, kink and fetish, and we can talk about that too. But um, specifically orientation would be um, kind of uh, the people that you're attracted to, which overlaps a little bit with gender, because the way that our, at least our culture, American culture, has described orientation is very kind of cis-normative in that it mm -hmm. presumes that um, a person that everyone is cisgender and that we are attracted to sex or genders that are similar or different from ourselves. Now I realize that sounds super I'm probably overcomplicating this just because it is an important thing for me to mm -hmm. break down and examine and not take for granted because I am a trans and queer person. So these traditional kinds of easy explanations, these like one sentence Googleable answers that you can Google. But <laughs> right now we're talking to us and so we're having this conversation. But um, <laughs> I would say the, uh, yeah, the, I mean, sex and gender are different things. Our culture likes to lump them into one kind of concept and they're, they're different. Um, sex has to do with our 
physiology and our um, bodies, our biology, and gender has to do with our culture and our society and kinds of the things that we invent um, and typically ascribe according to our bodies. But I don't know, again, I, as a very progressive trans person, I, I think that's maybe a rudimentary overview, but things are actually way more diverse and exciting than that. Nice. Yeah. And awesome. then relationship style. Yes. Uh, relationship style, again, I think for monogamously minded people, relationship style might be something that you take for granted because the whole world should or is traditionally monogamous, right? There's that one special person out there in the world for you. You find them, your soulmates, you get married, you have a family, happily ever after. Now that's okay, but it's, that's only one way that people thrive and find love and joy in um, sexual and romantic relationships. And only one of the ways that you can build a family. Um, so relationship style uh, talks about how there are more, there's multiple ways to find and connect and commit uh, to more one person or more than one person and in different ways. Um, it, it's just, a, it's another kind of landscape of diverse uh, human experience. So it, I mean, all of these things are super, like it can get like just really deep and um, dynamic and interesting and highly individual too. So everyone you talk to might have a different way of defining it. Uh, I know I am kind of struggling to come up with a simple version for you right now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's, that's my take. Nice. Well, that's part of why I asked you was because I feel like um, we all have a model that we're We've, we've been fit into because our culture says so by by kind of laying it all out like that because sex positivity is about exploring everything under the umbrella as we say like it's kind of all of these things together so that's that's really great um now in sex positivity in our whole culture um we, we come together and everyone has like their own journey and story to tell so like, my question for you is how did you end up there in front of a group of people, you know, at some yoga studio walking people through sex positivity and everything you've just been talking about? Um, well, I like to be the center of attention, really. No, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm an actor and um, mm -hmm. comic and like, I, I like being in front of people talking. So uh, quite frankly, that's how I ended up there. But um, how did I come to the community? Uh, I'm, I've always been sex positive and maybe not even knowing it consciously, um, but things like uh, just uh, consent and safety and education and uh, fun um, in regards to sexuality, for, for me have always been kind of fundamental concepts. And as a queer person too, it, it, it troubled me and at first confused me a little bit about how normative culture says that you have to be cisgender and you have to be heterosexual and you have to be monogamous in order to matter or in order to be normal and my experience my personal experience of the world was not any of those things and you know so i stumbled into sex positivity almost by necessity just in searching for answers about, you know, if, if I don't, if I'm not conventional or normal enough, what, what am I? Is there, is there language or, or ideas um, for, for what I experience in the world and for, for, for what I want? And uh, so, yeah, I came, I came into sex positivity, I think maybe officially through the book, The Ethical Slut, that was maybe my first official uh, kind of formal education, so to speak. Uh, yeah, so that's, and then I, um, you know, became part of the SPLA community um, through, you know, like just Googling and stuff about sex positivity and realizing that, you know, oh, there's a whole community for people like me. That's like, you know, I, again, kind of take for granted that there's actually community uh, when so much of the world is um, kind of 
maybe not even purposefully, but just sort of normative without even thinking about it. You know, even I kind of took for granted that there would be, you know, people like me who wanted to create their own spaces um, and, you know, make room to, to well, build community, basically, you know? Yeah. And uh, we talked a little bit about this before, and I'm just, like, curious, like, from where you started from, because you, you, you dealt, dealt with some adversity on your own coming from, like, a, a red state and uh, being adopted and so on. What transformation have you seen in being part of this community um, just from way back then to now? Hmm. Wow. Okay. So I guess I was such, I, like, I would, I was bullied for most of my life and there was never a time that I remember where I wasn't othered if not by other people from my own self you know I'm adopted I grew up uh, my parents are white so despite being Asian Asian American um, I you know was raised according to sort of you know uh, white normative you know kind of ideas um, and so even when it wasn't my community reminding me that I was different, I would also just feel and know that I was different because my experience of the world and how people treated me would be different from kind of the values and the expectations I grew up with, right? So like, for example, I would just walk through the world with this uh, just overconfidence that comes with privilege. <laughs> and then people would throw like, racist comments at me or and and it would confuse me and I, I would, wait a minute why am I getting this when you know my two white friends are not get, I'm like oh oh because I'm not actually white that's why so it's an, an interesting kind of um cognitively dissonant uh, uh, uh upbringing or just sort of childhood I would say that um and so I was always kind of very mistrustful of people and I became really like too cynical for a young person to really be. Uh, and I just became kind of, always kind of anxious and on alert and in survival mode, just, um, and that wasn't even just the racial stuff, right? It's just um, gender and queer stuff as well. There was always, if it wasn't one thing, it was another, right? There was always a reason to pick on Nikki. There was always a reason or somehow to single me out. Uh, and so it was, yeah, I just, I, I became misanthropic and mistrustful and that was kind of just the way I, I survived and made it through life. And I would say that after coming out as trans and finding a uh, sex positive community and uh, you know, artistic communities too for my art, uh, I be, I'm a kinder person now. I'm less, uh, just maybe less suspicious and less, jaded i guess um there is still a lot of crappy people in the world and i, I wouldn't say that you know i'm i've never experienced you know racial trans misogyny as an adult like i totally have but it's uh i don't know i guess maybe focusing on uh, i don't know exactly what it is but i I, I maybe I mean I haven't figured out maybe because I'm still in the process of you know becoming a, a gentler more tender caring person um, but sex positivity definitely is a part of that because as a way of life it asks us to worry about other people's ability to consent and other people's um, confidence level and I've become more emotionally literate and and I just, yeah, I just, I care more about other people's experience of the world, I guess. Wow, that's, that's really beautiful. Um, I love that. I'm thinking also of another thing I know about you is that you do improv comedy. And I know that's come through also a lot of times when we're talking about consent, in particular, when something that makes people uncomfortable, say, like, the safer sex talk. And, um, what what has that meant to you and why is it important um, when we're talking about teaching people about consent to use tools like improv? 
oh, I love using, well, I, I think like, like anything, you know, everything requires practice to get better at a thing. You, you have to practice it. So especially when it comes to like the safer sex talk and even just talking about sex and sexuality in, in general, I, I, you know, we only get better at it if we do it. But the thing is with the safer sex talk, um, like when I lead any of those kind of seminars or workshops, I really like improv and role play and acting because I'm, I mean, let's, let's face it. Like the, <laughs> I do not think that enough people are going, that, not enough people, but I don't think that most people are going to have enough opportunities to practice the safer sex talk in real life, as opposed to how many times they're actually going to need it. I mean, like how many of us are really going to meet up with a new person every single day and get to practice, right? So role play and um, improv, for me at least, um, is a really great way to sort of facilitate that practice and get, you know, get all those kinds of scenarios in, um, especially like in a safe controlled environment, a workshop environment where you're with, you know, other people who are doing the same thing, who are there for the same reason you are. Um, and it's just, it just, it's like rehearsal. It's like rehearsal for the real thing. So by the time that you actually are on a date with someone that you meet, that you connect with, that you really like, um, you know, you don't have to be nervous about something that's really important. And if anything, if you're super confident and feel really good at it, that could be a great opportunity for intimacy building really soon. So maybe it, not that it's a race, but you know, it, instead of dancing around something, you can sort of accelerate that timeline to figure out, it's like, well, are we compatible? Are we going to have sex today? Um, and, you know, and how, for me at least, it's, it's a lot of trust and respect and um, just sort of intimacy and bonding straight away. Like, if, if, if you can't have a safer sex talk with me, then we're not compatible. That's just, you know, that's a hard stop for me. So, um, for, for me, it's a little bit of a gateway thing as well, but, uh, but yeah, so it's, it's mostly for the practice and, uh, at least in like the seminars that I do, I also like to have sort of, um, like index card scenarios so that you get to practice, uh, you know, disclosing or hearing your partner disclose, uh, something that maybe isn't true for you. Like, you know, I might, you know, you might get a card that says, okay, in this conversation, you have HPV and you choose to disclose that to, you know, your scene partner and your potential love interest, right? Um, and maybe, you know, as a participant, uh, you do have, H everybody has HPV, but let's say, you know, you have <laughs> HPV and you find it hard to talk about that, right? Um, this you know, exercise gives you an opportunity to do that without necessarily outing yourself or disclosing something personal because you're playing a character. You got the thing on the little card. Everybody did. You know what I mean? So you can practice that sort of like within that safe container. Um, but then also, like, let's say your partner has, you know, oh, you, you know, do this thing or you really like this as a fetish and you choose to disclose that. You as you know the listener get to an opportunity to receive that as well and listen to how someone else can be vulnerable with you and you can hold space for that and then also uh, y'all can practice yeses and nos maybe somebody says your partner says something to you that normally in real life you're like a hell yes but you get to practice saying no just on principle that maybe that's not something that you want to do now or want to do ever and you kind of get that practice so when something in real life really does come at you um, you feel prepared and confident it's it's all about confidence really it's 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 knowing who you are and, and what you want and really uh, feeling confident and being able to communicate that to other people nice um. So on, along with doing improv, I also wanted to ask you about being on the show one day at a time where you have a recurring character. Um, I think what I really, really want to ask about it is um, there, there's not a lot of media out there that's like appropriate for like teens who would identify as queer. And that's something that I love about that show. So what's it like to be involved with that project? It's uh, super... I, I, 
just lucky. I feel it's one of the best jobs that I've ever had. It's um, the entire production team is fantastic. And I'm a fan of the show. So there's also kind of that, you know, wish fulfillment like thing where it's like, you know, I already like it and now I get to work on it. I mean, that's just extra. Um, but yeah, the, the, the mood, the kind of feeling I get as a cast member um, is that of family. It's, um, you, I mean, I don't know how to explain, you know, like sometimes you, you, you go to work and it's work. And sometimes you go to work and it's like, how lucky am I to get paid to hang out with my friends and make something that we all believe in? You know what I mean? It's, it's really special. Um, but even just like content wise, LGBT specific, um, I think what makes One Day at a Time and the Elena storyline so uh, resonate so honestly and deeply with people is because there's actual queer writers like writing it. And, and that's such a big deal, right? Because we, 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 when we talk about representation in media and especially in TV, it's, it's not just, oh, we need a token to show that, you know, we're not racist or whatever, right? It's, it's a full-on commitment to authentic diversity. Um, and not for PC's sake, but for the sake of it's better storytelling to have more than one point of view and to have those point of views be informed by real life. Like, I, I just think that's good art making. It, nothing political about it. And so why I think Elena's story rings true is because we have parents with queer kids, we have writers who are queer, we have writers who are non-binary, um, we have uh, all of, you know, we have, and then Latinx writers as well, because it's, you know, it's about um, uh, uh, Latin, uh, Cuban American family. So, you know, all of those authentic experiences from the writers and producers and the rest of the production team all kind of co come together to be able to create um, a character and storylines that the average viewer and audience member can be, recognize their own self or their own friends or their own family in. And, uh, and you know, One Day at a Time is not alone in this, um, but I, I do think that they are, they stand out as um, a, you know, a production team in a show that's truly full-heartedly committed to that kind of authentic representation and, and inclusion. Um, and, and it's just, it's very, it's very, very special. And uh, as a sitcom, they're able to take some really um, complex and sometimes often difficult things to talk about and package them in a funny, entertaining, uh, just sort of the whole family can watch kind of, kind of way. And I think that's also, really really special and just in terms of the the, the format you know because nobody wants to watch you know something that you know for entertainment that then is just being you know you're being proselytized to um or you know if you're in an educational mood great watch a ted talk but if you're not and you just want to laugh um not that not that ted talks can't be funny some of my favorite ted talks are funny <laughs> but um you know it's just it's that classic sitcom format that kind of can surprise you with how deep um, they can actually go. And I think that uh, with One Day at a Time, they're, they really stand out in, in that respect. So I just feel really, really fortunate to be able to work on that show. It's, it's, it, it's just, it's, 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 it's amazing. I can't say enough wonderful things about my experiences there. Nice. And you guys actually made history. And as I recall, you also I want to ask you about the making history part, but also that the show is like going to go away and then it came back and it was just, just tell us that story. Yeah, it's the little show that can. Uh, we, we are historical in being the first show to move from streaming to network um, up until now. The um, most, I mean, like and networks have been around for decades before streaming was even a thing. So it makes sense, you know, like, um, reruns would be on streaming or whatever. But uh, One Day at a Time is a 
reimagining of Norman Lear's classic One Day at a Time that was a network show. Um, but this One Day at a Time uh, was a Netflix production and started on Netflix for three seasons. And then Netflix canceled us and CBS picked us up. So we're the first to go from streaming to net network. Um, and CBS is actually the um, Pop TV, which is um, a cable channel owned by CBS. <laughs> uh, they picked us up um, first first. Um, and so we had season four premiered on Pop TV and now is being shown on CBS, um, just a network TV. So we're on, yeah. So check us out on Pop TV uh, and CBS and Netflix. I think the first three seasons are still on Netflix, but the new ones are all on Pop TV. Uh, but yeah, and, and CBS, I think, will have all of the episodes to as reruns. Um, like from now, uh, I forget like when they'll start, but it's they'll they'll all be available there um, soon. <laughs> nice, nice. And of course, you do shows other than One Day at a Time. You have a, you have a whole reel, but you're also getting into stand up now. Is that right? Yeah, so, I started stand up uh, two years ago. Well, mm -hmm. uh, pre pandemic, like I did for a year, and then the pandemic hit. Um, I love stand up, and uh, and I'm learning a lot. Um, it's it's so much more like writing and marketing than just telling jokes. <laughs> but um, but I've I've fallen in love with it, and I've fallen in love with with. I've always loved comedy, but I think stand up really um. It has given me a deeper appreciation for the psychology of humor and how important it is for us, uh, not just for entertainment, but you know, just as, as human beings existentially. I, I mean, we can get real into it, but I, I mean, for me, it's 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 like that important. Um, but yeah, I, I I came to LA like sixteen years ago, fifteen years ago, and I, as soon as I arrived, people were telling me, oh, you should, you should do stand-up. And I'm like, no, I can't do that. And I, I actually never really had any interest in it. But then just like a year or two ago, I, you know, a, a, some friends convinced me to give it a try. And I, I took a class, I fell in love with it, and now I, I do it. And the reason I tell that history is because I've, I've realized that it wasn't that I... I couldn't have ever done, I couldn't have started earlier, but, oh gosh, where, um, I'm sorry, I stumbled over my tongue there. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the point, Nikki, Nikki, the point, the point is the, um, I, I, the thing with stand up and with um, writing and having your truest voice and opinions come through is that you have to know what your voice is and I didn't until, well, I guess when I started a year or two ago, uh, you know, cause I came out late. I didn't realize that I was even trans until I was like 30. And then even after I came out, it was, um, it was a little, it's, it was a process to really realize that I'm non-binary trans because this is the thing. And I say this in um, my special that I wrote is like, words are symbols for ideas, right? Semantics. and ideas are what kind of provide meaning for us and there were no words therefore no no ideas no meaning for my gender experience growing up because i grew up in a place and time where there was only transsexual and which is an outdated term these days but some people still use self-identify as that um so i don't want to shade anyone who self-identifies but um especially if you're not part of the trans community that is an outdated term and it's we don't really use that anymore the um and so problematic within that was um again in in my childhood time uh you know um transsexual was um considered a a, a, path a psychological uh pathology there was you know a, a clinical diagnosis and um, it was kind of oversimplified into a born in the wrong body kind of dysphoria. And although very many trans people do experience gender dysphoria uh, and in, in the sense that they feel very not 
like the body that they were born into and assigned is definitely not the one that matches with how they feel like that's a real experience but it's not the only experience and so in my day just the concept of trans was so pathological and very binary actually ironically um that i didn't it didn't really fit me um but then too the kind of uh misogynist idea that anything feminine in a man was gay and that's just what gay is also was just very problematic it's still problematic but from yeah. my personal experience it just really uh, like i didn't know who or what i was and i think that i kind of just sort of made it through um you know approximating but it you know it's yeah, you know, at the end of the day, I'm I'm really fortunate to have a family that loved me. So even out in the world where it wasn't very kind, I at least would have a safe place to come home to. So a a safe home, I think, is fundamental. Um, but it, oh gosh, I'm all over the place today. <laughs> what are we talking about? Um, <laughs> You hit, you hit a lot of good topics in there, though, and something I just wanted to highlight was uh, this concept of not having a language for how you actually feel, and mm. also realizing at some point, like, things have changed, because I feel like people get very attached to the idea that they are one way. I am gay, I am straight, I am bi, I am, I am, I am. And the thing is, it's it's a fluid something that can change with time. You're, and we talked about this earlier. What is your gender? What are you presenting as? What's your orientation? Your relationship style can change with time. And I, I love that you hit all that. Yeah, thanks for helping me out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, because how that comes to comedy is like I didn't I, I didn't feel confident in being able to. See, the thing is, like I might have already known who I was inside but I didn't know how to communicate that to other people. And so that's why language is important. And yes, we label jars, not people, and, but I, I do think that there is still value in, in being able to name things and being able to name ourselves. Um, if anything, it's, it's an act of um, really claiming. It's, uh, it's, it's owning your own identity. And I think that's really, really important. Um, but yeah, so until I kind of really knew my own voice and my own point of view and things, I, I couldn't really do comedy. I'd just be imitating all the other funny people that I, I admire. Um, and now I have my own voice and that's, it's just, it's, so now I can do it, you know? <laughs> it's like nobody wants to watch a, a comic who just steals comedy from other funny people. Like that's. I mean, it's unethical, but it's also not funny. Like, you know what I mean? So it's, in order to be uh, an entertaining, well, a successful comic, it's like ethics is kind of built in. And that's something about comedy too. Comedy is not dishonest. You know, we, we, you, we might set you up, you know, mislead, but ultimately comedy always gets at truth. And, I mean, I would, I would philosophize that all art ultimately affects us because it touches on something true. And maybe not, you know, a capital T truth that we can empirically measure, but, um, you know, a human condition that, that touches us that we can feel. Um, so I think that's why I like art too, as, as a really analytical kind of person. Um, yeah. Art is what kind of feeds my soul, for lack of a better term. Um, yeah, so, and at least right now, comedy is my, is, is my favorite. It, it sparks joy for me, I guess. Yeah, just we're very Marie Kondo. Sparks yes. joy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I love that. Um, so we're, we're living through a historic moment. It's, it's a pandemic. We're all very separated from each other. And um, I know for me, my anxiety has become like a daily chore and something I have to deal with. And um, staying sex positive, and, and in particular, if you're a queer person, we're just seeing people having absolute big struggles with depression and anxiety and so on. So do you have any advice for our listeners about how to better handle this time or how you've been handling it and, um, and staying connected with community and the things that 
spark joy? Deep one. I, yeah, I think maybe because I have experienced seasonal affective disorder ever since I can remember. Uh, it's like it's it's it, it kind of even saying it out loud, saying, "Oh well, depression is an old friend of mine." Like <laughs> I don't I don't know how that makes me feel, but the um, gosh, one day at a time. I mean, you know. <laughs> Hashtag hey. one day at a time. Um, you know, it's it's. I mean, yeah, the 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 roller coaster of depression and anxiety I have been on during this pandemic is, uh, is it, it's it's painful and it's boring and it's frustrating. Uh, and you know, I'm sure you know there's millions of us all in the same terrible line waiting to get on the same terrible ride and then do it all over again it's just a cycle <laughs> right um so for for me it's it's you know mindfulness i guess and and gratitude uh you know kind of like new buddhist philosophies for us for you know i i mean uh, small things small things um the things that won't over overwhelm me uh and just try not to be too hard on myself or judge myself or compare myself to other people. Um, whenever something does spark joy, uh, to really kind of lean into that and appreciate it. Uh, actually, reading about like history <laughs> and um, about how terrible things have been for other people throughout, you know, what we have records of also bring, you know, I don't know if misery loves company or if, if it actually gives me hope um, it, it by just, you know, human ingenuity and tenacity and endurance. Um, just knowing that other people have survived really crappy times as well. Um, that helps give me perspective, I guess, and not um, just get into the black hole of my own kind of uh, anxiety and unhappiness, but yeah, it's, yeah, I know, man, uh, asking for help is important. That's something I don't, I don't do enough of. Um, and it's not really because I'm proud. It's just, I'm such a kind of a lone wolf. I don't, it just doesn't even occur to me as an option sometimes. It's just, you know, I'm, I, I think we're a culture that doesn't give people the language to ask for help. Like on, on that same line of thinking because I think that a lot of people have that problem yeah that's a really good point there's a kind of um there's a literacy in that that I yeah. don't feel like I know the alphabet to <laughs> yeah. but uh yeah yeah it's I mean sometimes it's just hanging in there um you know and sometimes you know little idioms help too like one day at a time or you know just forward. Uh, you know, there's that one song in Frozen 2 that um, that I thought was like very um, heavy for like a fam like a kids movie. But mm -hmm. I, I also I think you know we, we shouldn't treat kids as stupid animals who don't know any better either. So um, like Anna, the princess played by Kristen, but like I'm explaining this, to the, like everybody knows Frozen characters, but the, <laughs> the red-headed princess um, says uh, there's this thing in that movie about the next right thing, and I, I like that. I think, um, yeah, especially when it all seems lost or you don't know what to do, don't focus on saving the world. Just focus on what's the next right thing, you know, the next thing that you you know, without being moralizing, uh, you know, the, the next thing that you can do that's constructive or positive or beautiful or kind, um, you know, just, just one small thing. And sometimes that's even for me, just, just trying to see a different perspective, you know? So it's like, yeah, this sucks. And ah, <laughs> maybe it's not good, but, and like, wow, I'm really having a conversation with myself about how I feel right now in this moment. That's practice and being emotionally present and not judging myself. And we could all use more practice in that. So even if, you know, patting myself on the back for admitting 
and being honest about how I feel in this moment is the best thing that I can do right now. That's the next right thing. Then, you know, so be it. So be it. Like, why, why shade progress, even as small and tiny as it is? Nice, nice. Um, where can people find you? I am mostly on Instagram these mm-hmm. days. Uh, so my handle is at Mixnicky E. So it's just MX. I use the non binary or all inclusive honorific instead of Miss or Mrs. or Mr. Just MX. Um, and then Nikki, my name, N I C K Y, last initial E. Makes Nikki E. I think I, that's consistent through all my social media, but um, I kind of like post on Insta and then it automatically puts it everywhere else. Nice. <laughs> I'm, I'm not as techy as I as I'm techy enough to get yeah. by. <laughs> oh. Well, thank you for joining me today and thank you for watching. If you uh, watch this whole thing and you like what you saw, please send, leave me a comment or something and let me know what you think. Um, and I'm new, so be gentle and I'll see you all next time. Thanks so much for having me. Cheers, everyone. Thank you so much for watching this week's episode. If you want to see more, go ahead and hit the subscribe button so that we end up in your feed. If you got something out of this personally that was helpful to you, also please leave a comment below. I love hearing the feedback about what's working and what's not. That's what makes this show better. And until next time, love you more and we'll see you then.